I recently fell into a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories about how the US government, it's always the US government, is supposedly hiding some anti-gravity technology from us, some way to access the energy of the vacuum and whatnot. This isn't an entirely new story, but the recent episode was triggered by the Cybertruck bomber. That was when, on the morning of January 1st, a Tesla Cybertruck exploded in front of the Trump International Hotel in Las Vegas. It later transpired that a person had responsible for the explosion, Matthew Allen Leiversberger, had previously sent an email to a retired intelligence officer by the name of some shoemate. In his email, Leifelsberger wrote, among other things, that what we've been seeing with drones is the operational use of gravitic propulsion systems powered aircraft by most recently China in the East Coast, but throughout history the US. Only we in China have this capability. China has been launching them from the Atlantic from submarines for years, but this activity recently has picked up. I've no idea what a gravity propulsion system might be, even theoretically, and I'm a theoretical physicist who's worked on gravity for more than 20 years. Of course, that may just be proof that I'm a secret agent of the US government. That German accent is all fake. The idea that there's some conspiracy going on to hide new physics has been a theme on social media since Mark Andreessen quoted someone associated with the actual US government, saying, that they'd made a lot of maths disappear during the nuclear era. So Ben basically said, look, it doesn't make sense because to regulate AI at the technology level, you're regulating math. And of course, we're not going to do that. Like, that doesn't make any sense. And you'll recall that what they said was, mm. no, actually. We can classify math. We can classify mm. math. And literally, this was, this is verba this yeah. is verbatim. This is, this is, uh, we, we did, we, we, cla we classified a whole entire areas of physics uh, with, in the nuclear era and, yeah. and, and made, made them state secrets, like yeah. th of the, of the, like, theoretical physics, yeah. science mm. of physics. Yeah. Uh, we we classified them and made them state secrets, um, yeah. and that research vanished. Um, and we are absolutely uh, capable of doing that again for AI. We will classify any area of math yeah. uh, that we think is leading in a bad direction, and yeah. it will it will end. And at the same time, we have Eric Weinstein, who claims that he's been ignored with his idea of geometric unity, which could help us make contact with additional dimensions and greatly advance space travel. What kind of power would have to be generated? Like, what would be involved? So what wouldn't be involved is getting an entire planet to put a tiny dent in space-time, because that's not going to work. It would be a question of saying, I know about more degrees of freedom. Are those degrees of freedom accessible? Maybe the new degrees of freedom are things we can play with at the engineering level, and maybe they're inaccessible just the way we can't play with up quarks and down quarks directly. If we can play with it, then we've got so many new toys you have no idea. New forces, new matter, new possibilities to flit in and out between dark and light matter. But from an engineering perspective, how, mm -hmm. how would you make any of this happen? You would build something based on new plans that did something that nothing else could do. So today I want to try and put these things into context. Can you actually make maths disappear? And is it conceivably possible that someone has made the maths of some super propulsion devices in particular disappear? To answer the first question, yes, you can make maths disappear. That's undoubtedly happened in the past and is still happening. But it only makes sense if that maths isn't something that many other people could easily rediscover. In the early days of the nuclear era, there was a lot that physicists didn't understand and the maths was genuinely new. Just exactly how which nuclei decay into what and how much energy does this release and how many neutrons does this capture and so on. These sorts of experiments are not that difficult or expensive to reproduce, but they take time. That's leaving aside that you need to get your hands on some plutonium, but maybe LinkedIn can help you out. So this is one reason you classify maths, to stay ahead of the competition. However, there came a point where the physics of nuclear chain reactions was so widely known that it didn't make sense to keep this under covers any longer. 
It's another thing entirely with the technological details for how to build a good and efficient nuclear bomb. It takes a lot of time in testing and tinkering. Keeping this math top secret makes a lot of sense because it's not something that anyone can easily reproduce. When it comes to AI, it's a similar story as with nuclear bombs. You don't just build a $1 billion frontier model in your basement and play around with it. If some big AI company works out a way for how to make their model super intelligent, it can make sense to classify that maths exactly because it's not something that others can easily reproduce. That's not to say that I'd advocate doing this. I'm just saying it's possible and it would almost certainly work. So much about the question of maths classification. Now let's talk about the gravitic device or the idea that some grand unified theory will help us travel through the cosmos. If you want to go a very long distance, one possibility is, is that you do something very energetically expensive. But the other possibility is grow the ruler to shrink the distance. If the rulers and protractors that Einstein used, and he chose one through his equation, are instead variables and you have at full access to them. If I wanted to go a very long distance, the first thing I'd do is grow the ruler to shrink the distance, then go the distance under that ruler, and then I'd shrink the ruler back. Joe, by the way, is doing a really good job in his podcast in trying to get Eric to explain just how this unification-based space travel technology should supposedly work. And Eric basically says repeatedly, I don't know. But the truth is more boring. We know it won't work. If there are hidden sectors of particles in your grand unified theory, like there are in Eric's theory and in all other similar theories, then we already know that we can't do anything with them, because if that was possible, we'd already have found evidence for them. This is a point I'm afraid that a lot of people, including some mathematicians, don't understand about the foundations of physics. You can't just invent some new stuff, particles, forces, extra dimensions, and say, hey, it'll help us travel through the cosmos. You have to explain why, if we can do anything with it, haven't we seen it already? And no, you can't classify experimental data coming out of multiple international collaborations with several 10,000 people. This is conspiracy thinking. If physicists had seen anything new at particle colliders that didn't fit into the existing theories, we'd know about it. What we do know is that if there is any new physics left to discover, it's forces or particles that are either a extremely weak or weak interacting or b require extremely high energies to access or c it's not new forces or particles i'll explain this latter point in a moment but a and b is why particle physicists all follow the same playbook for introducing new physics it's always a fifth force that's incredibly weak or a particle that decays quickly or that's very heavy and so on why do you think they're doing this are they just not daring enough to invent something more interesting, like a beam that opens a portal into another dimension that we can go through? No, they don't do that because they don't know any way to make something more interesting compatible with what we know already. This isn't something you need to classify. There's nothing there. Let's then talk a little about those gravitic devices. One of those conspiracy theories which spin around for 50 years or so is the existence of a scalar wave that's supposedly a type of electromagnetic wave that physicists have missed for 150 years or so. It can be used to generate energy from the vacuum and also for advanced laser weapons and so on. Unfortunately, in 2020, a paper got published on this in a peer-reviewed journal which claims that the mathematics in question is omitted in the widely accepted version of electrodynamics, presumably for purposes of weapons design secrecy. Can you introduce a new scalar wave or particle into the known theories? 
Yes, physicists do this all the time, but if we haven't yet seen that scalar, it means it either interacts very rarely with the stuff that we know, or it requires extremely high energies to produce it. Can that couple to gravity? Sure. But you see, gravity is an extremely weak force. If you want to use gravity to create the acceleration of planet Earth, you need the mass of planet Earth. Doesn't matter how much new physics you introduce, it won't change the boring old physics. What about anti-gravity? Believe it or not, I wrote a few papers about the mathematics of anti-gravity just to show that it's possible to do it consistently within the framework of Einstein's theories. But it's not as exciting as it sounds, because it turns out that anti-gravitating matter, if it exists, is not something that we can use. Even if we would find it, even if we could produce it, we couldn't contain it or build anything with it. Stuff just goes through us like dark matter, though it might be more clumpy. The reason I was working on this was that I thought it could explain dark energy or dark matter. It didn't work, which is why I stopped working on it. It was not because the FBI threatened me. Now let me talk about the option C that no one ever seems to talk about. On a very general level, the question we want to answer is, if there's any new physics that goes beyond the theories that we have already, how can we access it? All the particle physicists do, all the talk about string theory and quantum gravity and grand unification and all this stuff, is about accessing it with either higher energies or very precise measurements at low energies or by waiting a really long time because these are the only places in the minds of particle physicists where we haven't looked yet. This is why they want a bigger collider. This is why they're shooting neutrino beams through the ground underneath your feet. This is why they're building bigger detectors to find that one proton decaying and so on. And in none of those cases, even if they'd find something, could we do anything with it? I know there are people who are going to complain about this again when I say this. How can she be so sure it's going to be useless? Because we know this from what it takes to find the stuff. You don't have to take it from me. Go and ask any other particle physicist, because this isn't something any of them has ever disagreed with me on. They don't expect to find anything of practical use with their current experiments. This is why they keep telling you fancy stories about how their measurements are supposedly revealing something deep about our existence, etc. It is possible that these findings would have eventually become useful. Maybe in a 10,000 years or so, we all have particle accelerators with LHC power in our pockets, but it's clearly not something that will happen anytime soon. So that option C is that the new physics isn't at high energies or at weak interactions. It's an emergent feature in large systems under certain circumstances. Particle physicists don't think about this because it's just not part of their territory. But chemists can synthesize molecules that, for all we know, might not exist anywhere else in the universe. They don't occur naturally. They exist on our planet because we've built complex technological infrastructure that allows us to create things that don't occur naturally. And this is where you should look for genuinely new physics at the level of composite systems that don't occur naturally. Arrangements of matter that might display new behavior that doesn't follow from the theories we know and that we haven't seen before simply because we never arranged matter this way. This is why I keep going on about the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Because that tells us that matter is, in fact, doing something that we can't calculate. We don't know how a measurement happens in quantum mechanics. This is where the new physics is, not in some new scalar fields or hidden particle sectors. It's a multi-particle states. Maybe the way forward is that I claim the US government is hiding the maths of quantum measurements. There's some secret cover-up going on to discredit anyone who dares question the quantum orthodoxy. Yeah, I quite like that. Hey Joe, can I come on your podcast?
Either way you look at it, maths is undoubtedly very powerful. If this video inspired you to look deeper into the maths of quantum physics or gravity, I recommend that you try out Brilliant. Brilliant offers courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. All their courses have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. Whether you want to know more about large language models or algebra, want to learn coding in Python, Python or know how computer memory works, Brilliant has you covered. It's a fast and easy way to learn and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. And they're adding new courses each month. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with a course on quantum computing or differential equations. Sounds good? I hope it does. You can try Brilliant yourself for free if you use smilingbrilliant.org slash Sabina. That way you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days and you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and give it a try. I'm sure you won't regret it. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.